great. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about network coding in uh, 5G and uh, I'm going to start by introducing some network coding. Half of you know it probably and it will be very dull and for those for, who, for whom this is new, I hope it will be less dull. I have a large number of collaborators, particularly just from the work I'm presenting here and I'd like to call out uh, to some of them, uh, Gina, whom you just saw, uh, Flavio, Wefe, Jason, uh, Morton, who are here, uh, and I'll call, I'll call on other people, I'll pick on other people as time goes on. So I'm not going to do a good job at uh, assigning credit. Uh, so we've heard a lot about um, diversity this morning at the panel. We also heard about combining Wi-Fi and uh, 5G, 4G, whatever, uh, whatever it's going to be that's sort of the, the real successor to the, um, uh, to, to, to the cellular network. Um, and uh, the idea here, and then we've heard also a lot about uh, management, network management, how it's going to be crucial in these kinds of uh, uh, heterogeneous networks, or diverse networks, uh, to be able to manage. And, and I'm going to provide here a direction, which is to use coding to make a virtual network. So in effect, if you think of what you do in coding when you have a point-to-point -point link, you have several symbols, each of which individually is not particularly good. And you use algebraic techniques to combine them in such a way that they look good. So you're really creating a virtual network already there, something which is uh, synthetically uh, reliable from unreliable pieces. Uh, it also, I would propose that we should reduce control and state information. We, we heard about scaling. There were some questions this morning. You know, when you have, I think, Dave Devorn and asked the question, well, are you really going to be keeping uh, all these different connections separate? And, you know, who's going to track of all that? Uh, and the idea is that really things cannot work. Um, particularly if you have a heterogeneous setting, if you're going to need to keep track of the level of um, state information that, that we currently keep track of. Um, we've talked about what is going to be included. I think we've all agreed that we don't quite know what's going to be included. Uh, there probably will be some sort of cellular technology. It may just be 4G for a while. Uh, Wi-Fi will probably be included, maybe Bluetooth, maybe millimeter wave, maybe who knows, okay? Uh, so it's probably going to be rapidly evolving. Um, as Thierry pointed out this morning, storage and network are no longer separable. If you recall his analogy to pieces of Legos, where I don't remember which color was which, um, we've heard also uh, a little bit after that about the, the issue of, uh, of keeping, uh, of, of accessing um, particular data sets, I think in particular when, when we heard uh, from, from Eric, uh, and a little bit also about security, which uh, has been touched upon lightly. Uh, I think in Antha I made a particular case that security was very important, uh, and we've just heard some security con concerns, but by and large we haven't really touched it that much. Okay, so I'm going to be really talking about random linear network coding, and please forgive the, the highly simplistic approach, as I know for, for many of you this is, this is old news, but the idea is that instead, instead of taking pieces uh, and decomposing them just as packets or chunks or whatever you want, and then reassembling them in such a way that pieces have to be individually identified, you're going to take pieces, you're going to combine them. I'll show you next what I mean by combining. Um, and it's not really that you're combining them in this uh, patchwork look, but otherwise, you, uh, you know, the, I would have to mix the colors. It would look brown. They would all look brown and be very dull. Uh, so, so you're combining them. And then any combination, as long as you have a sufficient number of these combined pieces, will suffice to recover the original data. So really what we're looking at is taking packets randomly, um, weighting them by, um, by numbers which are going to be chosen over a finite field, which we're not going to go into at all, uh, and considering that an IP packet is just a vector of numbers, now, numbers usually over a finite field, 2 to the 8 is a good choice of a field because it's, you know, you want a field that's big enough, and 8 is big, and so is 2. Um, so uh, packets now become more versatile, and, uh, and there are a lot of different things you can do. So what can you do? Well, one of the first things you can do is you can use it just as an old-fashioned end-to-end uh, erasure code. Okay, so here are three receivers, one on each column. Uh, you can see that the dashed packets are the ones that are missing. Uh, you need fewer packet resends, 
over say something like an ARQ. There was the example that was brought up before about uh, doing things in a stadium. Of course, you know, explosion of max, but also having to do a lot of resends uh, is is one of the problem in Stadia. Uh, and particularly, this would be would be quite bad if you have more more receivers. Uh, in this case, each packet is missing for at least from at least one of the receivers. So I would have to send each packet because each packet is missing for one of the receivers. So um, a simple solution here is to send two random combinations of the four packets. Each guy now has four equations, four unknowns, and he just gets stuck. And you can do quite a bit with this. Uh, we're very proud of these of these results. Uh, this was re this will be uh, presented in Australia later this year. Uh, these are experimental results in the Pacific uh, using coded uh, TCP. Here's a tunnel between um, Auckland, Auckland and Rarotonga. No, I have not been to Rarotonga. Uh, and uh, what you can see uh, on the uh, on the abscissa is the the dates. So these were very long uh, these were very long measurements. Uh, what you can see on the right-hand uh, ordinate is, uh, for the black dots, is what's um, basically in terms of, oh, okay, I'm just going to take this one. Um, this is uh, the packet losses that are, that are measured, and here you can see the good put in terms of megabit per second. Uh, for regular TCP, the one they're using right now, this was done with uh, NISPs, uh, and with uh, coded TCP. Okay, so you can see it gives you a very big uh, benefit, and uh, for this, and you know, we, we've heard in particular about places that are challenged. Uh, these places are challenged not necessarily because they have no money, but because they're in the middle of nowhere, and nobody's going to run fiber to it because they're tiny islands. Okay, the other thing that you can do, and I apologize for the over overlay problem there. The other thing that you can do if you have random combinations is that the lack of structure uh, is maintained. Right, so if you have something with no structure, you can keep having no structure by just recoding. So you take a random uniform choice of uh, coefficients, you then randomly uniformly mix them. Well, you know what? You get a random uniform choice of coefficients. So in particular, I can be adding packets over the network inside the network, which is really why it's a network code rather than end-to-end -end code, just like we saw before, uh, and. If I have a reliable first hop, I don't necessarily need to put in here the redundancy which is really needed because my last hop, particularly my wireless hop, is not reliable. So generally, I will have many, many hops before I get to the wireless. And I would normally, if I do an end-to-end -end code, like a fountain code, I would have to basically eat the cost of the losses on the last hop over and over and over again at each intermediate hop. Right, so I'm wasting all of that. So here, for instance, if I know that I'm going to have uh, losses on the last link, let's say 20%, it's picked out of a hat, so it works well with five packets. I send four packets, and at the last minute, I create a new packet, re-encode without decoding. It's a re-encode on the fly without decoding. And then I know that if one out of the five packets, because I have a 20% loss, uh, gets lost, uh, then I can decode. What does this give me? And I'll illustrate this in a minute. This means that if I'm doing an end-to-end -end code and I have three hops, each of them with 10% losses, I would have to say that I have a 37% loss overall, and I would have to put it up front, and I would have to pay for that 37% over each hop. If instead I re-encode, recode at each of the intermediate nodes here, basically I'm just going to add the redundancy right ahead of when I'm going to need it, and I add it gradually. So in this case, I have an 11% up upfront redundancy added, and I don't need to keep adding more redundancy. You can see that this is going to scale. The difference is going to scale as the number of hops increases. Because in this case, I only ever need 11%, always, at each link. Okay, So I could have 50,000 of these hops. Of course, that gets a little silly. I still only need 50. 10% uh, here, whereas in that case, the more hops I have, the more I need to put upfront redundancy and the more I'm paying for it. Um, so these are, this is under revision, so these are also, I guess, not even hot off the presses. They're hot off trying to get into the presses. Um, and um, this is uh, some, some work done with uh, our collaborators in, uh, um, uh, in, in Denmark at University of Aalborg. So what you can see here, it's, uh, it's an SDN, it's an open vSwitch 5. Uh, so it's basically like an open source 
OpenFlow uh, protocol. Uh, and what you can see here is with uncoded TCP versus um, having a stabilizing basically at the lower layer with 1% losses and 0 to 10% losses, where you can see that the losses between 0 and 10% are shown here at the abscissa. Okay? Uh, so you can see that the gains that you get from allowing just end-to-end -end coding are uh, significant. But notice also here that because you have an SDN system, you can recode at the intermediate node. So it's really like the, the daisy chain that I showed you before, except it's a daisy chain of just two in this case where the first hop always has a 1% loss, and the second hop has a loss that's varying. You can see that the gains can be quite considerable, factor of 10, in a way that's transparent, entirely transparent to the protocol. OK, so we've started out with point to point. Then we did point to point with some relays in between. What can we do next? Uh, well, you know, let's look at multipath and multi cloud. And we've heard quite a bit about heterogeneity. And also, we've heard somewhat um, about, uh, about distributed systems, and in particular, a little bit more when we looked, when we heard about, uh, about ICN. Um, so in the traditional approach to multipath, which I shall show later, basically you might be having two paths from a particular cloud. The question is, you know, if I allow you to have access to a new cloud, how do I even manage that? Right? I had sort of figured out there's two paths from the first cloud, now all of a sudden this new resource comes along. How do I even integrate that? resource in a useful, simple manner into my transmission. I would have to tell the first cloud, you know what, um, never mind about the green. I'm going to get the green from the other guy. Oh, wait, no, I just got the green. OK, how about you give me the red? Oh, uh, no, never mind, the other guy doesn't have the red. I mean, you know, you'd have to keep track of every piece. If I code, even if this guy doesn't have the ability to code, I'm just getting stuff. I'm just getting equations, OK? And I get them, I get them, I, and in every equation I get, I'm happy about it. So it's really enabling uh, packet networks versus just sending packets over paths, right? It's really dealing with things on a packet basis. So sort of taking the next step above, and instead of as opposed to just having you know point to point and point to point with several hops in between, you can imagine a multipath with several hops in between. So if I have a source, a client, uh, basically if I were to look at something like just point end-to-end -end coding, choosing the best path, what I would have is that, in this case, the best path would have you know, four hops uh, with 10% losses on each. So just like uh, the example we saw before, and if I use all paths and I recode at every intermediate node, I get, I get a very large gain of a factor of 2.7 without any scheduling. I'm not scheduling across the paths. I'm not scheduling within the paths. I'm just letting it flow. And why does that make a difference? <laughs> Let me show you this example. So in this case, um, this is uh, trying to join a Wi-Fi link and an LTE link. So the kind of example we've talked about oftentimes during the day today. All right, so what happens? I have these blocks maybe for my media files as I'm streaming a movie. Um, and for the sake of argument, I'm going to say that I get uh, the same the same throughput for my Wi-Fi and, um, and my LTE, which is uh, sensible enough. In which case, why not just put the odd packets on the LTE and the even packets on the Wi-Fi? The other way around. It doesn't matter. All right. So I'm sending them along, and I have my two network interface cards, and I'm recombining them. <laughs> this is the basic idea of doing something like, say, an effective multipath TCP. And I'm happily recombining them. I get packet one, packet two, packet three, packet four. And here I'm re reconstituting the original flow. This is all going very well until my Wi-Fi gets interference. We heard about Wi-Fi and interference today. And then I stop getting my even packets. I get packet seven, packet nine, packet 1001. And then what do I do? Especially given that the controls, again, going back to the question of Controls over these uh, over these paths and keeping uh, uh, over these networks and keeping uh, track of state. The control loops are completely different, and you know the time frames between these control loops are completely different. So by the time you noticed on your LTE that something's wrong, the time it takes for you to tell the LTE, could you please go out and find my missing packets that my Wi-Fi didn't deliver? It's an eternity. 
right? Because you, you have very, very long uh, delays. So of course, what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to code between the two. This plus is really not a plus between just two packets. So shorthand for the ra sort of random combinations you saw before. And um, again, I'm not well assigning uh, um, credit, but you can look over that part in the, in the room for credit. Uh, this is one approach. We've actually been talking about different approaches, but this is just one approach, which you'll see illustrated, where you first code a cause of two paths, right? just so that you don't have a packet relying on any particular path. And then you code within a path. And also Dan, who's there, who I haven't mentioned, is also working on this, uh, Dan Wisman. Um, and then you know, it goes into the network. It does what it can. So basically, here I'm coding within a path for losses. And here I'm coding across paths so that the two paths are making up for each other. And then the recombination seems you know, much more straightforward in the sense that if one of the paths goes down, then the other path immediately just picks up for it. I'm not switching off between the two. We've heard about handing off between one network and the other. I'm not handing off. Why should I hand off? A handoff is a hard decision. Why should I make hard decisions? We have enough hard decisions in our lives. So in this case, what was happening is that when one of the networks went down, I wasn't getting the average of the two. I wasn't getting the best of the two. I was certainly not getting the sum of the two. I was getting the worst of the two, right? The Wi-Fi goes down, it means the whole thing is down. So that was not a very good use of my networks because I'm basically just getting the worst of the two. In this case, I'm really getting the sum of the two. If the Wi-Fi goes down, that's fine. The LTE just gives me, you know, I only have half the rate available. That's all I can get. That's all I can get. Um, I'm going to not show you any of the, many of the results, but just show you maybe another implementation uh, stabilizing below. So this is now a multi-path um, uh, Im implementation, and you can see the you can see the the different losses. Uh, the only place where we're varying the losses is in the middle, right now. Um, this uh, this link over here, so that corresponds to the abscissa, and you can see the gains that you have in TCP by just stabilizing the layer below using the sort of SDN that we saw before. So how do I care about this in terms of 5G? Well, so here's you know the vision that's sort of emerging. So. You have a cloud, uh, coded cloud storage. You have caching at the edge. Um, you have stations, whether these are base stations, whether they're Wi-Fi, routers, whether they're whatever, I don't care. Okay? And here I have my phones. And actually, my phones may also be talking to each other, whether they're phones, tablets, whatever they may be. These guys may be cooperating with each other. We'll go to that later. Okay? And I don't have to keep track of who has what. People have these sums, whatever they may be. And they're just going to get degrees of freedom over whatever path they can from whatever source they can. And what do I mean by from whatever source they can? Well, let me give you an idea here. For instance, this is distributed clouds. In this case, you have four clouds. And you're going to put a random linear code on all four of these clouds. So uh, the heterogeneity here comes also from the fact that I'm over different servers. And you can see here there's cloud A through D. Over there, there's five clouds. Over here, there's four clouds. What you can see is that the first cloud starts early and then comes really fast, one after the other. Right? It's delivering fast. This one comes pretty early, but then it's kind of sluggish. This one is a little later, but at least it gives me a few more pieces. This one's pretty anemic. And at this point, I have enough pieces. I shout bingo, and I decode. Okay? So what does this give me? Well, here, in this case, I have five clouds, and I have 32 packets, which means that the no minimum number of packets per cloud, if I want to put the same number of packets on each cloud, is, uh, is seven. Okay? And in this case, what will happen is, you see here the mean, and of course, the, the um, uh, the, these bar here are the error bars. First of all, it's a little hard to figure out exactly how to schedule. If I only have two clouds, you can imagine how you schedule if you're not coding. You start at the beginning of the file for one of them, you start at the end of the file for the other, and then eventually the two will meet kind of like, you know, like you're building a railway. Um, if you have three, well, you kind of start one middle-ish, you know, one at the end, one at the beginning. You're hoping that if all of them have the same rate, you kind of all meet together at the same time. But if one is much better than the other, maybe you shouldn't start at the middle. Maybe you should start, you know. And then by the time you get to five clouds, good luck figuring out the algorithm, particularly given how variable the clouds are. And by the way, they're really variable. They're quite variable. So what you can see here, this is uh, with replication, where you're not uh, coding together. This is where you're coding. 
you're getting a big gain uh, in the time taken to, to download, but also you see that it's much, much more steady. Right, so your guarantees, your reliability has increased quite a bit. So going back to this vision for 5G, the vision is that I am pulling across whatever paths are available to me from whatever sources are available to me. And that's going to include my peers, in particular peers at the edge. So let's see what that means to have is peers at the edge. Um, I'm just not going to go into that. So basically, the idea is I'm going to have this coded mesh now. Part of the mesh is going to be in the wireline domain. Part of the mesh is going to be in the wireless domain. And everybody's just coding ahead. And because it's all random, I just don't care what's going on. Okay, so everybody just coding, randomly get the stuff, codes it, sends it out when it gets asked to send out, and doesn't try to stress out about who was supposed to do what. And here's a cute little example. It was presented uh, last year. So here's an example of a file made up of 16 chunks. I'm going to break it into four chunk pieces. So why do I care about this? Because remember how we talked about maintaining the data in this coded way where everybody's just randomly mixing, right? So this is not... This is not looking uh, very controlled. It's not supposed to be controlled. You just totally let go, right? I mean, there's, there's no state here. Um, and imagine that I'm really talking about an edge network where we're peering at the edge. We're going to call that the fog later. We're peering at the edge. Uh, and people come in and out of the room, OK? Uh, at this time of the day, people are more likely to go out than come in. But let's assume that for the time being, people are coming in and out, and the number of people in the room is constant. So there's 10 people in the room. When somebody comes in, he connects randomly to three people. And when somebody leaves, okay, the, he takes that data with him. Okay? And each person only has four chunks, and the entire data set is 16 chunks. Okay? So there are enough people to, to keep the data set alive. So here you go, here are the people, three people at any time actually are going to leave, and then three more people are going to replace them. And when they come in, they connect to three random people and say, hey, what you got, and, and try to get some data from them, four units of data. And what you see here is, um, for here, this is a somewhat different example in terms of 15 chunks stored in five racks. If I was doing this with... Uh, structured code, like say it reads Solomon code. And read Solomon codes are good codes. You know, they've been around for a while. We, they, they've held us in good stead. Um, somebody who uh, is going to leave, somebody else comes in. You first have to get chunks from everybody in order to create a valid read Solomon chunk. Okay. So basically what you're going to need is you're going to need an input output of 15 with most of it in between these racks, what we're really calling racks in terms of the storage sense of the racks, in between these nodes. And for among these nodes, you're then going to have to make this, this, uh, this processing also. You're going to need to decode and then encode a 15 by 15 matrix for the new rack. If instead I use a randomly in network code, each rack, each unit, each of you will mix and recode and send one chunk to the new arriving, newly arriving uh, member of the edge network. And in that case, what's happened is, of course, I still did have 15 units of I.O., but all of it almost was intra-rack. Intra a node was doing it itself. You only had a transmission of four, which, of course, is quite important because that transmission would generally be the wireless transmission, the most costly one, the one that would have to share spectrum. And moreover, you can see from here that the memory consumption, the memory consumption of the read sum and the RS versus random linear code is much, much greater, right? Because in the random linear network code, I just get whatever was available. I only need four chunks. With the read sum, the new entrant needs all the chunks, needs to decode and re-encode. Okay? So you can see also that in terms, this is uh, memory consumption up here in the ordinate, and this is time down here in the abscissa. So here, are quickly done, and, uh, and you get on. So what does this give you? So we refer this to this uh, affectionately as uh, the melting ice cube. And we don't quite know why it works, uh, but uh, Vitaly Prashitov, who's in the back there, thinks he might have figured it out, or at least some of it out. Um, so. Uh, this is uh, over here with no coding. And let me tell you what these different axes are. 
this is basically number of parents. How many people you connect to when you come in? Right? The more people you connect to, the better off you are. But the more cost there is in bandwidth use. This is the amount of storage per node. How much can a node hold? How many chunks? And over here, right, in this vertical axis, is the probability of retrieval. By now, you know, the node coding is very sad. Okay, this is like, you know, the worst case of global warming, if you think of this as an iceberg. Um, and over here, you know, the read sum is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of valiantly keeping up there for a little bit. But you can see where this is going, right? The thing's doomed. Um, and over here, if you look, oh, it started over again. If you look over here at the network coding, of course, you can't have, no, you know, you need to have a little bit of storage, extra storage. You need to be able to connect to enough parents, right? But besides that, that's okay. You know, you have this plateau, which is a very, which at least experimentally is a, is a stable plateau. And as I said, Vital is trying to figure out if it's really a stable plateau. So at this point, um, the idea is, you know, for us to also be able to use the fog, so the edge wireless cloud, proximate peer to peer. Um, and we, we're going to have to worry there about things of security and. Uh, um, Armand Reze, who's there, has done quite a bit of work on this in, in my group, uh, really looking at um, how we can use coding to ensure anonymity. Uh, but there are many things like resilience to pollution. What if you're coding and somebody puts in something that's bad? Um, to what extent can you, particularly in the wireless domain, use peers to watch over each other, what people call watchdog uh, algorithms? Uh, how can you force peers to code correctly by colluding to keep nodes honest? Okay, so we're basically colluding to make sure that somebody doesn't do something they shouldn't because we now all overhear each other. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. So I'm going to skip over the um, security stuff um, and basically just go back to the original thesis, which is I think we can definitely think of using coding to make virtual networks. Uh, synthetic, stable, synthetically stable networks, even though what's going on below maybe too ugly to describe and we don't even want to look at it. Um, we can also use that to reduce the signaling for uh, control and for reducing the amount of state information that's needed, in particular tra keeping, uh, uh, keeping track of chunks of information. Uh, it allows us to become, as I said, highly opportunistic and omnivorous, right? Whatever happens to be lying around and available, I'll just use it. Um, it allows us to deal with rapidly evolving domains, for instance, the nodes that are coming in and out. I don't need to be worrying and pre-planning that somebody's going to leave the room. They're going to leave the room, they're going to leave the room, right? I'll, I'll deal with it uh, the best I can. I think it also indicates that the storage and networking are not separable. Right? They're, they're all the same thing. You're, you're just, you know, it's not that you're going to a server and you're just waiting to make a connection to that server. You don't care about the server. You want to get your stuff, whether it's cached, whether it's at the server, whether you know it's being held, at least partially coded by the guy next to you. It shouldn't matter. I mean, if you're going to be just you know working on things which are based on content rather than uh, rather than location, then that has to be um, and that has to be the mode. Uh, and finally, the just just uh, even though I didn't talk about it, security has to be considered inherently. I think that. Just looking at efficiency and being really happy about distributing everything and then going, oh no, you know, now any single idiot can just completely pollute my whole system. Uh, that, that's, that's bound to, to lead to tears, right? Um, so it has to be inherently considered, but fortunately, one of the nice things about coding is that it does give you some inherent security, whether it be by error detection, error correction, and a variety of other methods. And at this point, I am at uh, right on time and I shall stop. Are there any questions? 5.30 on a Friday. <laughs> yes, Andrew. So, so is there more to be done on the security side? Are yes. you saying that it's inherent to network coding? Or that this, no, no, this that's not. No, so it has to be inherently considered. It has to be considered as you go along. I think there's a lot to be done. There's been a fair amount done. Um, but there, there's still quite a bit to be done, uh, particularly um, in looking at I mean, I'll give you some example. You know, some of the possibilities that you can do, and, and we've considered the, this trade-off is, uh, I can uh, use something like homomorphic encryption and note that a packet, even though I wasn't able to decode it, 
is not what it claims to be. I can then throw it out and use the network coding and as erasure coding to make up for the packet I throw out. Uh, instead, I could just wait until I've decoded, if I think that's very unlikely I'm going to get um, attacked, and without any sort of crypto, notice just by computing a polynomial hash, which a polynomial hash which is in the open, that that whole chunk was bad and I toss it, right? Or the other approach is I could actually overlay an error correction code, usually MDS codes, on top, which will, sub which will keep their structure, even though they've gone through a random coding uh, transformation, uh, and then try to correct up to a certain amount of pollution, right? And to what extent one is better than the other will depend, for instance, on how likely you are to be attacked, right? So if it happens very, very seldom, maybe you just throw a whole chunk every so often because you're not that worried about it, right? Um, if you're worried about denial of service attacks where you think that, well, I want to discard a packet that's bad immediately because if I keep forwarding it, it's using resources downstream in my system, uh, then you know I may need to put in some homomorphic encryption so that I make sure that I don't I, I, I may never I may never accept something that's incorrect as correct but I may just flood the system with bad stuff and use all my resources that way that's just an example of the kinds of things so no I think there's a lot to be done a lot to be done in this area but but the, the point is just that intrinsically it gives you tools right so you should be considering it from the beginning any other questions yes Yes. So yes, yeah, so the question, just, just to repeat, the question was about the decoding complexity and making sure that they're sparse. So what I've shown you, I wasn't making sure that they were sparse, and in many cases it just doesn't matter because it's actually not that hard. Uh, there are many ways of doing sparse. I'll just put in a plug for Morton's talk next Tuesday on fulcrum codes, which are type of network codes uh, which have particularly good complexity um, um, uh, properties and, and, and particularly for, for the decoding. So if you come to Morton Peterson's talk, which I think is at 2, and at, yeah, pardon? Monday. Monday. Oh, Monday, not Tuesday. Don't go on Tuesday. I don't know what talk it is, but it's not going to be nearly as good as Morton's talk. So on Monday, much better at 2. Maybe, I think it's also in this room, but there, there are posters around. Uh, come to that talk. And, okay. Any other questions? At this point, I would like to thank all our wonderful speakers and all of you for coming, and particularly Jin Feng Du for pulling this together. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.